Thanks for joining us, guys. Today, I am very excited to introduce you to Tony Buckwell. Uh, I've known Tony for must be a little over six years, and I'm very excited to be having this conversation uh, with him today. So um, let me give you a little bit of background uh, on our guests. So Tony is uh, actually originally, he trained as a diesel mechanic, uh, but he spent 24 years as a career firefighter. So 24 years as a professional in any industry uh, is a long time. So sufficient to say he is really at the top of his game there. And then I suspect many of his friends, I'm interested in your perspective on this, Tony. Um, Tony made the unusual choice of going from uh, what's probably one of the most trusted professions in the world to one of the more uh, questionable real estate sales. I don't know where exactly we sit in there amongst lawyers and used car salesmen, but um, the, the, the choice of profession is always an interesting one. So I'd love to get your perspective on that. But I, I, uh, Tony's quite a humble guy, but it needs to be said, in the six years that he has been selling real estate, he has made phenomenal inroads and he is a specialist in the Hobsonville area. And he is consistently, in fact, the last two years, he's been number one in the Hobsonville branch. But that's not just um, number one in a small niche. Out of a company of 1,700 salespeople at Bathroom and Thompson, uh, over the last couple of years, Tony has been in that top 50, which is a massive achievement. Uh, but what I really like is um, Tony's ability to kind of just take things calm, professional, and he, he's had a consistent theme of constant improvement, which I'm really looking forward to getting his thoughts on. But uh, without further ado, welcome Tony Buckwell. And Thanks, uh, Tony, perhaps you could uh, kick off and tell us a little bit about your background. Oh yeah, well look, um, that intro actually made me smile because you're so right. Um, transitioning from the fire service to real estate was a, was a big step. And um, coming from a profession that every year um, was surveyed as either number one or number two most trusted profession in New Zealand going to real estate where, as you say, it's, you know, be fair to say, wouldn't be in that top 10. <laughs> um, so what did your mates say when you told them the news? Um, well, look, those that knew me um, felt that it was, it would be a good fit for me. Um, but it was a big shock to my fire service colleagues when I resigned. Because I didn't, I, I wasn't forced out the door. It was just a voluntary choice I made. And in general, we have some really long serving um, career firefighters. Me at 24 years by no means was the longest. You know, I had colleagues at my rank level who were 30, 40 years plus in the service. And it, there is a tendency to get a bit institutionalized there. So um, to voluntarily make the call that, an, that, you know, that I wanted a change in my life, I want to re-challenge myself. Um, certainly came as a bit of a surprise to those around me, but in retrospect, you know, it was a well-considered decision and, and no regrets whatsoever, you know, six years later. And I guess six years later, um, if, if you could have seen the future six years ago, did you think that you would be in the position you are now? Um, I have a lot of confidence in myself, not in an arrogant way, but in, a, in the way that I know if I apply myself and work hard and have an open mind to learning and developing myself, that there's every opportunity to do well. You can never guarantee things in life, but I think all you can do is give yourself the best shot at success by putting the right building blocks in place. And that's certainly what I did from day one, year one. That was my real focus in year one, was putting building blocks in place to establish a sustainable business rather than just trying to come in and start making sales um, from year one. It'd be fair to say, and this might sound odd, that making sales was lower down my priority list in my business development plan in year one. If it happened, great. I looked at it as a bonus, but I'd set myself financially, to be honest, to be able to do the whole first 12 months in this new career without making a single sale. If, if, if it happened that way, as it turned out, it didn't. As often as the way, if you don't push something too hard, it actually comes to you. If, if you're watching this right now and you've thought, oh man, I, I wonder what it would be like to get into real estate. Um, there is some solid advice already coming to you right now from Tony, because it's an easy industry to look at from an outside perspective. And even when you first get introduced to it and the, the business owners say, oh, it's unlimited earning potential and you could do seven figures and that kind of thing. But the reality when you actually get into it is that you don't earn a cent unless you're actually achieving sales. 
and uh, it can be a pretty pretty hard road getting established. You talk about the building blocks, and I love this because I think the fundamentals uh, across a wide variety of locations and demographics and personality types uh, are so similar. So I'd love you to perhaps outline what are some of the building blocks and what did you focus on in that perhaps that first 12 months? Well, one thing I think we all have to acknowledge is that when we come into this industry, we're not going to be immediately seen as the, 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 the new gun agent that everyone's going to want to list with. You are in a very competitive environment with lots of well-established agents, regardless of where your geographic area is. So one of my early thoughts was, rather than just putting bog stock marketing out there as in personal marketing, I've got to establish some point of difference. How do I get cut through even in terms of like your pamphlet material you might start creating in year one? So for me, straight away, I had a mindset of, I can't just be putting out DLs. I'll do a complimentary appraisal for you, all that sort of standard stuff. As we all know, we get probably 10 of those in our mailbox every week. So there's no point in just being another piece of recycling. You know, um, if you're gonna go to the effort and expense and trouble of marketing yourself, and I'm just talking letterbox at the moment, you've got to have something that cuts through. Now, really, unfortunately, I don't have any of them left anymore. What I'm gonna just show you is, if I don't know how well this will come across on um, video, but this was one of the early um, marketing assets that I had created by my marketing team. So it's probably not going to show so well, but it's the shape of an eye. Oh, that looks good. And this is really specifically about promoting um, video, property video and, and, um, and the benefits of video. This was just one example. So rather than just having a standard flyer, I had this, which is sort of like in a booklet form, and then had material about the benefits of video, then a little bit about me. And then on the back, and this is the best I can do at the moment, you'll see this little <laughs> here. So, Mate, I remember seeing your cutouts. They were yeah. not standard DL flyers. They uh, were fire hydrant flyers so, on the shape of them, right? Yeah, so that's an American fire hydrant. And I decided early that this was going to be a brand identity I was going to go with, obviously with the linkage back to my previous fire service career. So I did have some DLs that were die cut stamped DLs in that red, in that shape. So they actually were cut out in that shape with some messaging through the middle. My thought was, if you're emptying out the junk mail or emptying out the mail in your letterbox, at least that's at minimum going to grab your eye. Oh, what's this funny fire hydrant shaped bright red thing? And then it had some really simple messaging in it. Now, I knew, how, how did I measure that this was working? When I followed up this early activity with my early door knocking, I would get, when I introduced myself and my name and just where I am from, people would say, oh, you're that ex firefighter guy that's been mailing out. And instantly I knew that the strategy with the, um, the you know, the hard, the, the paper marketing was working because if there hadn't been some sort of um, trigger in someone's mind that that marketing was different, they never would have made that connection to me when I was standing in front of them at their door. So that was a real huge moment for me when people would say that. It was just inside I would be going, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is something that we've talked about as far as marketing goes and creating a point of difference. Um, being a firefighter doesn't necessarily make you a better real estate agent, but it can make you memorable if you choose to make it. Yeah, it's just something that has a subliminal connection that people associate your name, your marketing collateral and who you are. There is obviously a message behind that, which obviously I was trying to promote, which I was trying to bring the integrity of me as a fire officer through to my new career. I obviously wanted to bring the benefits that I have of that connection that, that Kiwis have with trusting firefighters into, hey, look, I'm the same person, I'm just doing a different role now. And hopefully that integrity that I had then is, well, not hopefully, the integrity I had then still with me now, I hope that the people were registering that. So that was really yeah. uh, my key marketing decision was why to create this um, little brand image so on my Facebook page, my website, every bit of collateral that you'll find anything to do with me, somewhere in there, you'll still find reference to that little file. And a huge point, a huge point. Um, Tony and I uh, exchanged text messages the other day and literally after Tony was the fire hydrant emoji. So a, a point that strikes me is that it doesn't matter that six years have gone by, your brand is still consistent. Yeah, I decided that that brand was going to carry with me right through my career. There's no point in starting and establishing a brand, to my mind, 
and then dumping it, unless you assess it as being wholly unsuccessful or detrimental. <laughs> but if it's something that you still gel with, you still identify with, people still ask me about my fire service career, even now, even though now it's getting six years gone, it's not as fresh to me anymore, but it's just good to have that point of difference. That's my point. Point of difference is key. Otherwise, you're just going to get mixed up, you know, just lost in the masses of other agents doing, you know, standard um, marketing. So that was one point with my startup. It was just getting a focus on creating something different. And I want to come back to the fire career. Um, it, it'll be interesting to hear some of the other lessons that you've learned in that career that you've been able to apply successfully here. Um, but before we do, though, you talk about those building blocks. So if I, if I can kind of unpack one key takeaway here is that finding and identifying what your kind of point of difference is or the thing that's going to be memorable for people, that it's both um, authentic to who you are, yeah. memorable for the customer and something that you can kind of put a spin on, yeah. And then doing it consistently in a professional way takes you from being unknown to being the go-to person alongside the other things. So what, tell us about the other building blocks. You touched on video. Was that a big thing for you? Yeah, absolutely. I was an earlier adopter of um, property video. I could just see that, that not many agents were doing it. I couldn't work out why. Well, actually, no, I can work out why because it's a bit nervy to get into it to start with. Um, but I, I could see early, why wouldn't you be promoting property using video? The spin-off, and I think this is really important, that you don't have your own branding profile as being the reason you do it. Um, put selfishness aside in everything that you do in real estate. But um, it has a great spin-off that you're going to promote the property better for your vendor. Um, but also people get to know you. I mean, every time I run open homes now, I'll get someone come through that says, oh, it's really odd meeting and talking to you. I feel like we've already met before. And I know why it is that because they'll say, look, we've watched the video two or three times, you know, this week before the open home weekend. So they've already almost created a little warmth and connection with you before they've even come to your open home, just through that extra engagement you get with video as opposed to just still photography and words. Um, so yeah, I, I, I took it on early. I, I haven't, counted now how many property videos I've done, but it would be in excess of 100, I would say. So just starting to feel a bit more comfortable with them now. You made a big point there, which is that when people actually meet you in person for the first time, they feel like they already know you. Yeah, and really importantly, the person they meet at the open home should be the same person that they thought that they were meeting in the video. There's no- So what are some one, tips for doing that? There's no one persona for the video and then a completely another when someone meets you in the street. I like to think that when people meet me in real estate, if they then meet me at the supermarket, they get a sense that they're talking to the same person. I don't put on a big front with my um, real estate agent or with my, with my professional career. Obviously, there's, you know, there's things you know, that, that you do in your job. Um, like I might let an odd swear word slip out every now and then in my private life that you wouldn't do at an open home. But just being genuine, being who you are, is really important. So with my property videos, um, yeah, I try to just be as natural, genuine um, as possible. Um, trying to learn to relax is something that you can only get through doing it. I'll, or I'll still remember vividly when doing my first video and just having massive butterflies, um, but really enjoyed it. And back then, Barford and Thompson were doing, of all the videos that came out of the week, they were selecting their um, feature video of the week. And my first video I ever did got um, featured on the Barfoot and Thompson website and uh, amongst all of the Barfoot uh, company, which was a, just this huge buzz for me. And really that just reinforced to me, I'm doing the right thing. This is what I've got to keep doing. Yeah, so the, you could say there was a bit of beginner's luck, but I'm sure yeah. that there was a lot that went into it. So can you walk us through perhaps what you've learned over that period of doing those videos? I know the, the, the um, the goal is to be comfortable in your skin and to be able to connect with people the same way yeah. through that video as you would in real life. But that's the goal. What are some of the practical things that you found helped you to be more warm and natural on video? Oh, okay. Well, look, everyone's going to find their own way of doing this. So what I'm about to communicate is not necessarily going to work for everyone because we've all got different personalities and just different ways that we're wired. For me, I'm a, I'm a prepare, prepare, prepare type person. Um, I like to feel in control of everything that I'm doing. Um, and the best way of doing that is to not just rock up on the day of the video and think you're going to wing it. So for me, I have a content structure all worked out. 
including which scenes of the house I'm really wanting to feature, how I'm going to transition from one message to the next. Um, not quite to the point of camera angles, but the videographer I work with consistently every time, we've just built this really good working relationship now. He knows the style of video I do. One thing in terms of a really practical tip if I could give someone looking at just getting into video is when you are writing your dialogue or your script or your concepts is try not to create too long a line that you're going to be doing directly to camera. So I do quite a bit of agent to camera work. So that meaning the camera is actually on me while I'm talking. Um, if you're going to do that, that's great because I think it does create that warmth and that engagement, but try not to create a huge long line that you need to do straight to camera because once that camera goes on, it's amazing how everything <laughs> can disappear <laughs> out the ears. So, so um, a great way of doing it is when you're forming that bit of dialogue or that bit of script is just have like a little intro line into something that you're going to be talking about with planned cutaways with your video, video, videographer sorry, to that feature. Let's say you're talking about the amazing pool area or whatever by all means be standing in the pool area and saying, wow guys, check out this incredible entertainment area. But within the dialogue carries on, it switches to voiceover and there's a lot of cutaway to camera shots. So you can, it can appear as though you're doing a long line and have remembered your script really well where you actually haven't, yeah, so. Yeah, you, you mentioned a couple of key things I just wanna draw out. You're doing a lot to camera, but you're not the focal point. You're focused on doing a good job selling the property. And by doing that naturally, you look good. The other part that you talked about was um, having a consistent videographer, someone who understands how you like and how you want to work. I think that's a huge point as well. Yeah. Um, and would you walk us through a little bit more of your content structure? Oh, yeah, sure. So um, what's the formula? Well, intro, middle and end. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness. Um, look, what I... It, it is literally, you've got to have some form of introduction to pull people into the video. Um, several times I've done that where I'm not even at the house. It might be at a really amazing local park that's only just around the corner from the home. But you want to get that incredible like neighbourhood shot and then even a quick shot of you walking around the corner arriving at the front door. There's many ways of doing intro. But really intro, then just working through the the guts or the you know the main body of the video being the real strong points of that house that you want to highlight. Video can't be long, so you're not going to be talking about every room and every benefit of the home that would just get too much. So you want to really think about what are the strong points of this property I want to highlight through this video. Um, and then you do need an outro at the end, you know, a thanks for joining me type message and an invitation to, uh, to come to an open home or give you a call for a viewing. I know that sounds pretty templated, but there's huge amounts of variety within that that you can apply. That's just the basic bones of it. And those points are literally all written down on a script. I mean, I do have a script board with me that I'm madly looking at just as the video videographer is getting his final focus and then he gets thrown in the bush just when he's ready to say go. Um, so, you know. <laughs> I, I, I've got this great mental image of you diving back into the bush to grab it as you go, oh, hang on, what was that really great point I had? <laughs> yeah, well, sometimes it blows away, which doesn't help either, yeah. yeah. But look, I, I, I can honestly say now, I, I mean, I used to rehearse my 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 videos in literally in the mirror, like the, the day before, the night before, the morning of a video. I don't feel I need to do that now. As your ease, it, as you get more at ease with working with video, working with your videographer, as your tension level drops, your creativity grows and, your, and the way that you can be more natural, it grows. And I honestly think if you know your content, like what you're wanting to say really well, you've got that quite clear in your head, that actually lets you be more expressive. You're not like, standing there like a robot just trying to remember the lines because then you lose all your personality. So yeah, the more prepared you can be, I think the more natural you can be. That would be a way I would yes. summarize that. Yeah. And it seems to me that when you talk about being prepared, it's knowing what you want to talk about, not necessarily memorizing word for word, these eloquent sentences that are actually not really authentic to who you are. Yeah. And look, and I've talked to other agents and they just have a really basic idea of what they're wanting to get across and they pretty much just turn up and wing it on the day. As I say, if that works for you, great. And I'm envious of people that can do that. But for me, um, yeah, I, I, I do need a little bit more set structure, but that's just the way I'm wired. Yeah. So video was something that you kind of utilize as, I, I guess, one of the proponents of it. Marketing, got a clear um, 
branding, what about your strategy for getting your brand out there, apart from the actual tools that you use, like those DL cards and that kind of thing? How did you begin to develop your own client base? Well, uh, to start with, I mean, you, everyone's got to start developing a database. I mean, you, if, you don't have, if you don't have clients somewhere, you know, with a record of who they are and their numbers so you can ring them, you've kind of got nothing to work with in real estate. So um, I committed heavily to door knocking in year one. So identifying a couple of um, two farm areas I wanted to work with. And I think for anyone thinking that's new about a farm area, there's two questions you've got to ask yourself is where and why. So where is your farm area going to be and why are you farming that area? So for me, I had two farm areas of about roughly about 300 properties. The first one was in West Harbour and that's where I lived at the time. So the, the where was in my local area and why it was my local neighbourhood. Why wouldn't I want to talk to my neighbourhood with families that have got children in the same school as me and go to the same sports club locally, all that sort of thing. So there's a natural synergy there when you're in your own patch. I find it hard to understand why agents, some agents farm well away from where they work and live. It just doesn't make sense to me, but I know it does happen. The second farm area I, that I um, targeted was in the new growth area of Hobsonville Point. Now, for those who haven't heard of Hobsonville Point, it's a, it's a master plan community in Northwest Auckland. At the time, uh, when I identified that, it was six years ago, and it was a very new area. So it was in its early stages, had pretty much new properties that new people were living in only in their first year. For that exact reason, very few agents were bothering with it because they didn't see that there would be any yield in their effort because people only generally move, you know, every five, seven years what it is. So why would you bother putting effort into a brand new area? I so what did you it, find? What, sorry, what was that? And did you find that to be true? Yeah, well... I, what I found is I was the only one marketing, like directly marketing that area, going and meeting people at their front door. Um, and I knew once again that there was a long game in that. You know, if you establish yourself in that area as someone that had taken the time to go and meet people at their door, that they may well be, you, you could be the person that they call in four or five years' time. Now, as it's happened, I'm only, it's only six years or five years later since that happened it's now the biggest selling area of me in my career um, if I look across my sales record um, Hobsonville points massive and I'm actually living there now um, and you know would be regarded as one of the two or three agents in this area as sort of you know that sort of go-to agent to, 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 that someone would call yeah so yeah early investment pays dividends Tell me about your door knocking strategy. So this is year one. You're going in there to build a database. You've identified that you want your database to be comprised of people who live in your local area and also the people that were in this new area, Hobsonville Point, at the time. How did you go about building that? Um, well, I think it's really important that if you're going to door knock, you have some idea in your head as to what it is you're going to say if someone answers the door, <laughs> uh, rather than just standing there. Look, for me, my message was clear. Um, I was just introducing myself. Certainly in that first round of door knocking, there was no hard sell. Um, I wouldn't even necessarily offer an appraisal. If it came up during the conversation, absolutely, I would log that for follow-up. But really, my message was, Hi, I'm Tony. Uh, I live in your area. I, you know, I'm working in real estate. Um, like you, I get, you know, 20 flyers in my mailbox every day and I've lived in the area for 10 years and I've never had a real estate agent actually come and introduce him or herself to me at my front door. That's the sole reason for my, you know, for my visit today is just to say hello so that you can put a face to a name, to a flyer. You've actually met me. We've had a chat. And if there's anything outside of that, happy to help you. But otherwise, it really is just an introduction. Um, now that soft um, or that not hard push approach was so well received by people and so many people answered the answer when I sort of delivered that bit of um, that message was, you know, you're so right. I've lived here for 20 years and I haven't had a real estate agent come and actually knock on my door and say hello. And people would congratulate me and say, well done for, for doing what is probably quite a hard thing to do. Um, but out of it, it did actually generate some inquiry. So every day, every day I went door knocking, I would come back with some form of warm lead follow-up, uh, a CMA, um, someone saying, look, we're not thinking about selling now, but we definitely are later in the year. Um, you know, so we, it's a bit early now. And then really importantly in that situation, I would always ask, 
well, would it be okay with you then if I diarized a call back to you and say, September, how would that work for you? As soon as they say yes, you've now got the invitation for that warm callback. If you just left it without that, without that question, you could have made the contact, but it still wouldn't have been at their invitation. So that, that's um, just a little technicality thing, if you like, uh, that's worth um, remembering. Um, but in terms of creating the database, you can't create a database just by door knocking. You have to have a reason for, or, or a, some way of obtaining people's information. And, my, and so my little extra was that I would have a uh, local newsletter, you know, e, an e, email um, newsletter. And I just asked people if they'd be interested in joining that and just keeping up with local events, not necessarily all real estate. They might have local things coming up at the school. And people were interested in that, especially Hobsonville Point, because it was such a new area that, that the people moving to there wanted to engage with what was going on in the community. So by asking them to join your email database, they are now in your database. But you had to have a reason for why would they want to be in your database. It's not and just- I think you must have given some pretty compelling reasons, because I recall back in the day talking with you about this. And I think, did you have a success rate, something like 80% of the people you talked to? Yeah. Happy to... That's yeah, massive. It was... It was, it was, um, yeah, it was pretty, pretty impressive. I mean, I thought I would, I mean, I had no idea what my success rate would be, but um, yeah, the amount of people that I door knocked that actually joined my database was quite phenomenal. The success rate on it was quite phenomenal. Um, and that really is the start of everything going back to that it was all year one stuff. And that was all the hard yards out on a weekend, you know, um, hitting the footpaths, you know, door to door, um, and honestly, David, the whole time I did it, I can only ever think of one occasion that I got an adverse, you know, sort of reaction of someone, or like the sort of the go away, slam you, door, <laughs> slam the door in your face. So I'm I'm happy with that, and and you know, I can deal with that. You just walk away and think, oh, they're just not having a good day. I don't think that was about me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're good, good, good person having a bad day. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and one final tip about door knocking is only do it when you have any, when you've got the energy to do it. So I would set an absolute limit of a sort of maximum two hours door knocking. Um, I would find that if you're putting your best energy on and your and your best smile and your best warmth, that it gets hard to do that after two hours. It's just it's quite fatiguing, you know, because you've got to be up, you know, you've got to be in a really positive frame you know when you meet people so i wouldn't go beyond the point where i started to feel fatigued or you're actually not going to come across well in the face-to-face -face meeting so i would how is that how is that different than motivation you talk about energy level but what about the scenario where you're just like oh i can't be bothered going out and doing this oh look let's be honest that was there were many times it would have been easier to have not done it um to put the suit and tie on, or actually I didn't wear a tie because I, I felt it was a bit formal, but to put you, you know, your good clothes on and get out there again, there were many times where that was a struggle. But all I can say is if you do it, when you finish and you come home and you've got two or three warm leads in, in, your, you know, in your clipboard or your, you know, whatever, you just feel so good for having done it because you know you've made a positive uh, difference for growing your business, you know, and, and then you can reward yourself by going and, having a kick around with, you know, with, with a ball with your kids or whatever after you've done it, but just do those hard, those hardest things to do are the things that will bring you the greatest rewards. And they're also the things that other agents won't be doing. And that's really important. Well, this is so interesting because your script, in fact, I'd love you to give it to us again, but that you, your, your kind of um, first door knock script re literally references the fact that you've never had anyone come and door knock. Yeah. But you're not the only person that's told me this, Tony. It strikes me as interesting because if I look at the patterns in a huge number of successful salespeople, there's been the, um, the cold outreach at the door. Why don't the others do it? And, and, and I guess I'm, I'm curious to know from, from that, um, that, that place, is it, is it the consistency that separates you? Is it the ability to grit your teeth and get through it? What do you reckon? Oh yeah, definitely. Like you've got to have consistency. You've got to have um, that um, fortitude to keep to go. You've got to be prepared to take a risk. I mean, I think the reason some agents maybe don't do it is they're fearful of rejection. You know, and that's part of our industry. It's part of our job. 
missing a listing, you know, missing an opportunity, whatever it might be, that can happen. But if you don't put yourself out there, you're never, you're never going to get the yeses if you haven't been prepared to get a few noes. Um, and look, some people are just not as, I'm a real people person. Some people are not as comfortable just meeting face to face someone at their door or their house that they have never met before. I'm different than that. I would, I've, I've never um, done telemarketing because, and I know you're a gun at that and you, you, you know, you took me on some workshops for it, but it's just one element of uh, real estate prospecting that I've never taken on because two reasons. One, I don't think I'd be very good at it. <laughs> um, and two, I guess it, what I always look at in real estate is what did I not like before I was a real estate agent? And one thing I still don't particularly like is receiving calls at night, you know, from power companies or whatever. So I figure if I don't enjoy it, it's hard for me to go and deliver that same thing to other people. Whereas most people are reasonably happy to have a quick two or three minute, five minute chat at their front door, meet someone new and say goodbye. You know, it hasn't really, it hasn't really annoyed them so much as perhaps what a phone call might be right when the kids are screaming and, dinner's just about ready and you know so yeah and i think the key message here is that you 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 knew what you wanted you wanted to create a database of people that live in a certain area and you went well right what's something that i wouldn't mind have happening to me so you're authentic to yourself with how yeah. you approached it yeah. and and you found a way to actually get to to your goal yeah and I, what i would say is you don't have to door knock forever either like i'll be honest i haven't done it probably for you know two or three years now but when you're starting it's gold it's a way of meeting and um, uncovering some opportunity that otherwise you just wouldn't know about how else are you going to get to go out and meet prospective new vendors um if you're not out meeting them you know and then you build momentum off that so my first probably half a dozen listings were in that farm area as a direct result of um, door knocking and then off that once you've got that listing that then creates that next layer of opportunity for meeting people through your open homes and those many times those people are sellers coming up you know they're future yeah. sellers so it's just creating that momentum those building blocks to be able to to be able to keep growing from but you've got to have something to start with you can't grow from nothing yeah so before we get to that momentum off listings one last piece, you said you telemarketing, not you, but how did you follow up from those initial contacts? Because I think that's a huge piece to this. It's sure you've gone out and you've door knocked, but what are the next steps before it actually came? Oh, look, at, um, for one thing, um, didn't just door knock once, you know, I, I, I went and recovered the same area again. And the next time it was a high, hey, you know, it was maybe been a year since we last talked, you know, how, how things been going, you know, there was, it wasn't just a one off event. Anyone that expressed, um, interest in follow-up for some reason as i say a future appraisal um, maybe they just want some advice on how they could prepare their home for sale if they were to think of selling and i would go and do that for in my own you know time and with no obligation no no um no conditions on it you know you just go and give your time um, and obviously the people that were being introduced to your database were then suddenly getting regular direct contact through your um, newsletter that you're creating um, might be that you'd list a property similar to someone that you know you've met in your database and I would call them and say, hey, there's a house just like yours in the neighborhood I'm listing. Why don't you come through one of my open homes and just look at it, see how you think it compares. And then when it sells, we can have a chat about that. So it's just multiple angles or avenues that you can use your database to affect. Once again, it's not about trying to push or create listings it's just keeping contact keeping relevant and being genuine and those things all tended to further down the track result in some level of business let's talk a little bit about that momentum piece so you're starting to get listings now and you're actually growing the business off those listings what yeah. do you find worked best for you um well listening to people that come to your open home is a really good idea they <laughs> people will drop hints and they will reveal info. If, if you're good at starting a conversation now you don't want them to feel like they're being interrogated but if you're just asking the right questions in a in a, in a warm and genuine way quite often you will um, get an answer that might surprise you now I'll write back to one of my very first listings in this area I'm talking about a lady came through she wasn't looking to buy the house through me through my talking to her and I said, oh, I'm just curious to know then why you would be coming through if, you know, if you're not um, buying. And she said, oh, we're actually looking to sell soon. 
And I said, would you like me to give you a call about that? Maybe I'll come and see you in the next week or two and I'll have, have a look through your property as well. And she was really pleased. Yeah, she said, yeah, that'd be great. And she was in my register, so I had all her information. When I um, followed up with that and went and did meet her and her husband and went around to their home, which was a stunning property, she said, Tony, you've, you've given me faith back in the real estate industry. She said, I've dropped that hint with probably five, six, seven other agents at other open homes I've been to and not one of them you know, like took my lead or took my, uh, my indication that I was actually thinking of selling soon. She said, I just can't believe, you know, how cut off um, agents are if you're not looking to buy the house they're marketing. So if you keep your ears and eyes open and your antenna up, there's all sorts of opportunity that comes out of those open homes. And that was an example that ended up being another listing which sold really well at auction um, just through listening to someone and responding to them. It's a huge message to not just see things the way you want to see them, but actually be very aware and in the moment to really listen to what people are saying and what's behind that. Because they're yeah. not just going to come up to you and say, hey, can, can you list my house? <laughs> yeah. And, and, and treat everyone with the, with the same. You know, Don't start categorizing your people in your open home and giving all your attention to who you perceive to be potentially a hot buyer and someone else who you perceive to be maybe um, a tire kicker because they the person might be a tire kicker in terms of the sale of that home but there's been several occasions now where someone's come through and they've been very open with me at the, as they've left the open home to say hey Tony just to be honest with you you don't need to call us back about this home but we came here to meet you we'd seen your marketing properties in the area and we wanted to see how you run an open home and how you greeted us and, um, and they basically said, look, now that we've met you, we want to talk to you about listing our home. They were really like straight up about it. It was, there was no, you know, sort of coded yeah. language. So you treat everyone as though they're an, an A, important person to you that comes through your open homes. Yeah. And B, remember that the open home is a job interview. Absolutely. That's, that's a really good point. Every, every person you meet is potentially a job interview. That could be your next commission that you're you know that comes out of the, the next words that come out of your mouth could dictate you know a future income for you in two three six months time whenever it might be and certainly i think um if we're going to continue that analogy further the way you market that property is almost like your cv your resume oh yeah you're sitting there the difference in how it looks and, and actually i've had feedback from other people uh, in the business um, about the way that you market property and also the way that you work in with other salespeople. Um, and uh, perhaps you could share a little bit about how you sort of prepare the seller's case and the information that you, that you get ready and how, how you um, handle that inquiry in the market. Yeah, um, big thing for me is, especially in today's environment, is having a really comprehensive set of information for buyers, you know, to um, comply with all of your disclosures and all of your information um, provision. So right at the start of a campaign, I set up a very comprehensive um, canned response in my Gmail system. And that's got a Dropbox link into it that has every possible document that I can get, uh, that I can get my hands on. So every inquiry that I have come through, um, if I know I've sent them my property file for a property, I know they've got a full comprehensive suite of information. Now, part of this is to assist with the selling process and part of it's to cover myself in terms of future potential REA um, uh, complications, which I'm glad to say I've not come anywhere close to, but um, I spend a lot of extra time at the start of a campaign setting up really comprehensive information. In terms of marketing, um, you're, not, you're doing your vendors a a disservice if you don't promote their property at its absolute best. So this is going right back to when you're setting up a marketing plan with them at the time you're listing. I virtually don't have to talk people into including uh, HD video, um, property videos in the marketing plan now. When they see that every property I do, um, or let's say 99 out of 100 or, or, or you know, 9 out of 10 have video, there's almost an expectation from them that they're going to get video. Um, and certainly when you share some videos you've done and they see how well they've promoted that property beyond what photography could, it's not a long conversation. I just put it in my marketing plan that I present to people and they, they invariably just say they want it. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So a big part of what I do that I think some agents also maybe are a bit 
shy around, a bit reluctant around, is I'm very upfront with my vendors as to what they need to do with their property to get ready for marketing. Uh, I see our job as being the full consultant to a client, not just taking the property as they're going to give it to you and then hope for the best. So I always get permission um, and vendors invariably say yes to ask if I can walk right through the property with them with, the, with them with their clipboard and pen and let's talk about what needs to happen to give them the best result once we're on the market. So I, as a result of that, it's very, very rare that I get a poorly presented property that I'm marketing. They're generally right up to scratch, looking amazing with, you know, just it makes my job so much easier. It's just a privilege and a pleasure to market them when, when the vendor gives you their property in, in, in that sort of pristine condition. But um, if you avoid that conversation, you've probably got no one to blame but yourself if you end up with a whole lot of dogs of properties because that's, you know, you've got to take control of that. Yeah. How, how have you um, got to this place? You, you, I remember you talking to me about your um, business philosophy of Kaizen. Oh, yeah. T tell yeah. me a little bit more about that. So Kaizen has been, I would say, at the core of my business growth, my business improvement strategy from the start. So for those who have never heard of it, it's actually a, um, it's a, it's a, Jap it's a philosophy that came out of the Japanese um, assembly um, and um, industry. Uh, and, and, it's, and it's basically, it's a, it's a way of how do you move productivity or efficiency forward um, when it seems like such a big complex business. And although, you know, a real estate business is not as complex as say a car assembly plant, the theory, the philosophy is the same. So it's a philosophy of just um, continuous incremental improvement to break it down to its core. Um, actually, I look at- how up, have you done that within real estate? What's well, been the application of that for you um, personally? How it, how it works for me is never sitting on your laurels, never thinking the business assets, the structures, the, the, everything that the way you're doing it is good enough. Constantly looking at every element of your business and seeing how could I improve that by one or 2%? Not how can I suddenly leap from being the, you know, the 800th ranked agent in your business or whatever it might be to being 100. That's a big shift. And if you look at trying to do that in one giant leap, it seems impossible. So don't try and do it that way. So when I say um, self-assessing my business, I'm just always looking at all the elements. So a classic would be early in the piece, I realized I was really rubbish with digital technology and social media marketing and that side of things, just because of my age. I didn't really grow and come through school or my early work years embedded in that scene. So I knew that having a strong digital footprint and a strong online digital presence was going to be really key to being perceived as a modern agent. Um, and thanks to you, because you actually put me on to the consultant who I still work with today, I put that as a focus of my business growth for that particular year. It was a real focus point for my business. The element of my business I wanted to improve hugely was my, my digital presence. Um, so there was a real focus in on connecting with the right consultant and creating a website and updating my Facebook pages and just getting everything looking um, really professional, consistent, and that it all worked. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm hearing actually a, a really interesting blend here because there'll be some people watch this who go, I had door knocking. Well, that's out of date. But at the same token, actually that worked hugely well for you, but yeah. not at the expense of you not having an online presence. No. You actually invested in that deliberately so that anyone who then goes, oh, who was that guy? Gets to see who you are. And so that when people are turning up to your open home, it really is the job interview. They already think they want to hire you, but they're actually now just checking you out to see, does the audio match the video? <laughs> yeah, look, we're living in an era of digital research. You know, people are checking out businesses and services online well before they even consider going, to, you know, with them or contacting them. So if you don't have that, that digital shop front, it's the way I think of it. That's my shop front for people that I haven't met yet. Um, chances of them contacting me are a lot lower. Now, once you've created that digital front, it lets you just feed so much into it. For example, um, I now, rather than just getting a written testimonial, will sometimes ask a client if they'd be open to doing a quick video interview after a, after a sale and getting a video testimonial. And so I've got a, you know, I've got a, a bank in my website and my video libraries. Some of them are properties. Others are testimonials. It's really cool if you can direct a potential future 
client to actually listen to what uh, how other clients have found working with you from their mouths, not from not from you promoting and saying this is who I am. Nothing's better than hearing other people saying how they felt working with you was. That's been huge, um, and it's you know you can send links to that to people that maybe contact you. Um, you know, obviously it can be in your um, on your YouTube channel and your Facebook um, business page on your website. There's multiple places that you can put that sort of um, material. Just because you don't know how to do it doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. No, nah, because I don't know how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've got a, I've got a little bit better, David, but I'll be honest, I'm still a caveman. So no, look, it's, it's no different than you don't try and write up your own uh, will, for example. You go to a solicitor because that's what they do and they're not going to miss things. They're not going to make mistakes. Um, if I if I reckon if I'd carried on trying to do my own digital work, it just would have ended up in a real mess. Plus, it took me so long to do things that my digital consultant would do in a quarter of the time. So the time that I was saving, I was going and door knocking or I was doing something else that I knew I had confidence in the ability to do. So it's to me, it's no different than just employing an accountant to make sure that end of your, beer, end of your business records are correct and the IID if they audit it, everything's going to be perfect. The digital marketing consultant's just someone I've brought into my business to help me with things that I'm not strong in. Mm. This is a really interesting topic to talk about because it really comes down to time. And when I think about Kaizen or personal growth or business growth, I, I'm immediately conscious that there's this um, tension within where I want to grow, I want to do more, but I also, I don't necessarily want to spend less time with my family. Yeah. yeah. How have you managed that? Um, quite poorly to start with. And it was, it's been one of my big learning curves, probably at about year three, things really sort of um, hit a big speed hump in the road for me. Um, business was growing well. Um, you know, my income was growing from the outside looking and everyone would have thought, Hey, this, you know, you're doing really well, Tony, you're doing everything you wanted to do, getting into real estate, but there was a price to pay for it, which was, I was starting to get down personally and I was really missing my two young children and my wife. Um, and I know I've shared this story with you and I don't mind sharing it with anyone that might be watching this. There was, to me, there, there came this breaking point where one day I was just driving through Newmarket with my wife. It was just the two of us in our car. Um, we had to go and do something, I don't know what it was, in the middle of the day. And, um, and she just said, how's things going, Tony? And that question just, I just burst out in tears. Well, from normal to just absolute burst out in tears while I was driving. Um, and we just had to pull over and talk. And I just said how terrible I was feeling. I didn't feel like I was doing, being a good father. I wasn't giving my children enough time or her enough time. And that I felt like I was just turning into a work machine, just pumping out work, pumping out income. But me, I was starting to die inside. I was really starting to feel bad. Um, I had no time for myself to do anything I enjoyed. So I knew at that point things had to change or this business wasn't going to be sustainable for me. It, it really was a, a moment in time where I had to reflect and really think about what, what can I do to change this. And, and what did you do? Um, fundamentally, I had to look at the business structure. I was still working alone, doing everything, growing more and more um, clients and listings and still doing everything myself. Um, and I wasn't giving myself a break. I wasn't being fair to myself. I was, I was disregarding what I needed to be healthy. So there was two really big changes I made. One of them was um, deciding how I needed to get some extra support into the business. So at that time, I decided I do really need a sales associate. I need someone to share the workload with. Um, for others that might be bringing on a PA, I just want to say that this is just the way I did it. Everyone's going to have their own... Um, needs and, and, and what do they need to offload admin or do they need to offload some of the front face stuff like open homing for example for me I felt like I needed a sales associate I needed someone I could share the workload with open homes and logistics um, during the week so um, that decision was made that then always opens the next question who what sort of person do I need how am I going to pay them you know there's just a whole new world you start breaking into and there's no bible I guess the first yeah, yeah, so I guess the first thing is if you identify where you're at the point where actually um, 
you're you're now running on fumes in terms yeah. of the amount of time you actually have for yourself and for the things that are really important in your life. Yeah. Then yes, you have to you have to do something about it. And for you, where you were at, were things already running as kind of optimized as they could be? You had to get you had to actually bring on some support. But rather than just grabbing the first person that kind of walked through the door, you thought about, well, what do I want? Do I need a PA or do I need someone to help me with the runaround and front yeah. facing stuff? Yeah. But once you had that clear in mind, what was the next bit for you? Yeah. So you're right. There was a lag time between realize like this realization and then actually implementing it because it, you just can't make it happen the next day. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a bit, I'm a real planner, preparer. I like to have all my ducks in a row. So I felt like the first thing I needed to do was um, work on what a um, service contract would look like for me. What, what would I be taking to someone I was going to ask if they wanted to join me? What would I be taking to them in terms of an offer? So I spent probably a good two or three months just working on formulating a service agreement and put a heap of time into it. And part of that was interviewing other agents, just having a coffee, interviewing is a bit formal, just having a coffee <laughs> with a couple of agents that um, had, had uh, associates as part of their business over years and just asking, like, well, how did they, how did they structure that remuneration-wise, work-wise, job description-wise? And I, I pulled in a lot of information from different people. And, and out what of conclusions that, did you come to? Well, I came, there was some really good content in there, but the conclusion I came to is that none of what the other agents were doing with their associates sat well with me. So I was decided to do something a bit different. And I'm really um, focusing here on the remuneration side of things. Mm. Um, my mind I guess that's the thing, because if you think about what is it that you actually want someone to be doing, if the remuneration doesn't line up with what you actually need them to be doing, then this is not destined for success, is it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, you're going to offer a position to someone, but unless they see that there's an advantage to that, to what they're doing now, like working alone as an existing agent or whatever, why would they come and work with you? Um, so I spent quite a bit of time really mulling over the remuneration. And obviously, I don't really want to go into the actual figures and stuff with you, you know, mm. in the forum. But basically, what I did is mo I think most associates work either exclusively on a commission sharing type arrangement, or they get paid on a just on an hourly rate like a retainer i decided i wanted to blend both um so i've got a sort of a hybrid model of um um retainer plus um you know commission sharing now there's there's two sides there because the question might be why why would you do that um i think that the retainer is great because it helps your associate to navigate through times maybe where they're not selling a lot and they're a bit down on selling uh, income. So they've got that to sustain them. They've got a family and bills and everything they need to pay as well. And I'm very conscious of that. Um, two, I think it does um, promote loyalty. You know, the fact that you've gone and given that extra bit, you know, with your associate, they, it, the ones that I've worked with certainly have appreciated that. And thirdly, I have heard of, agents who have um, taken on associates with just a commission sharing model and they've then gone and asked them to do certain activities and tasks and the associates basically just said well no that's got nothing to do with selling or or promoting property so I'm not going to do it by having a, an element which is an actual base pay if you like um, and then an associated job description there's just really no arguments over that sort of you know those sorts of uh, you know, other tasks that might come into our weekly um, business activities. It's, it's just a given that, that that will happen, yeah. So the, so finding support was one of the two changes that you need to make. What yeah. was the other? Uh, the other? The other big one was just g giving myself a break, you know, like I, just recognizing that I couldn't, I'm not a machine. I just can't keep working seven days, you know, 80 hours a week, 90 hours a week, whatever it was, um, all year with no breaks. So yeah. um, what I did is I, I, I uh, talked to myself, <laughs> negotiated. Uh, um, so one thing I do now, and this has been absolute gold, and anyone I would recommend, you know, an agent who's busy is set out some time in the week that's yours and you just block it out and you don't make appointments. Now, for me, it's um, fr on Friday afternoons. If you're a busy agent, you're working Saturdays and Sundays, you need some time off. Otherwise, like I say, you're just working seven days a week. So from about probably a year and a half ago, I've been giving myself 
sort of, I'll, I'll work on a Friday till about 11 a.m. And that's literally just for any last setup things I need for the weekend. Um, or it might be meeting a client potentially for, you know, for the future. But come 11 a.m., I'm knocked off. Um, my wife works till about midday and as a laboratory scientist at Auckland Hospital. And we'll often meet, she'll just drive home, we'll meet at a nice cafe somewhere and we'll just sit and we'll talk with no, children are still in school, so it's just our time. Um, and just relax, you know, and just do something real, even if it's just sitting in the sun all afternoon. Inevitably, the phone does go and that's your choice as to whether or not you want to answer it or not, or just completely zone out. Um, so that's the sort of the weekly relief I get. Um, and then I feel much more energized going into the weekend for open homes if I've had that nice time off on a Friday afternoon. And the other thing is mandatory midwinter holidays. You just have to book it in. Um, generally speaking, real estate's a little bit quieter through the winter months. Um, so I'll book a good extended holiday, you know, sort of 10 days to two weeks in the sort of June, July, August window. And thankfully, now that I've got two associates that are brought into the business as well, you don't even really have to let that be at the expense of your business because you've got backup there to continue with open homes. In fact, the third, when I first uh, brought my first associate on, it was one of those real high moments of real estate when I was on holiday and he negotiated a sale for me while I'm, you know, in Fiji with my family. It was it just an awesome feeling to know that your business can keep going without you there. Yeah, that's massive. Um, yeah, yeah. So Christmas time, it's obviously an extended break just organically because not, you know, the real estate industry goes pretty quiet through that time. And for me, midwinter, and that's non-negotiable. You just have, or, or actually, I lost it this year because <laughs> it couldn't be. I know. COVID <laughs> so um, we started, my wife and I, talking about where we would holiday around the world. And um, then that just cut, got cut back, cut back, cut back as COVID was growing and growing. And then it's like, oh, well, let's just book something really great domestically around New Zealand. And now we can't even leave our region. So, yeah, I'm not quite sure where this year's holiday will be. But we will do something once, you know, once things free up a bit. Yeah, we'll still have that break. Yeah. Mm. Let's talk a little bit about this current situation. So yep. we've just enjoyed, a, well, a little over a month of lockdown. What's, um, what are you doing right now? And what do you see as being the critical elements for your business in the coming um, years? Look, I sometimes feel a bit awkward when I answer this question because, you know, we're obviously all ask, sort of all asking that. I've, I've um, had quite an enjoyable break. <laughs> Outstanding. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was really busy early in the year. Straight after Christmas, things just hit, hit the ground running for me as soon, you know, as soon as we had the, uh, the Christmas break over with. But look, I haven't completely ignored my business. I've filled some of my time in by just doing things like getting into my Gmail contacts and going right through and doing a huge clear out of, of you know, dead contacts or, or, or people that just ended up in there somehow accidentally or whatever. Done all my CPD training for the year so that when I start back, I, can, I don't have to worry about that. So I just did some online training. I've been doing some online training, um, non-verifiable stuff as well. Um, uh, yeah. Kaizen, I've been looking at some of my letters and my and my documents and reformatting them and just just updating them a bit and just bringing in some new headers and things that were updating branding wise that needed a bit of updating. Um, my office at home, huge clear out. I feel so good sitting in my home office at the moment because I just feel completely uncluttered. I've got my you know my my laptop and, and my essential things around and that's it. There's not a single bit of paper or you know, old contract or anything to be seen. And it's amazing for me, once again, this is my my wiring, the way my brain works. I just feel so much more positive and productive if I don't have clutter around me. It just really helps me to keep a clear thought process. It just manifests in how I feel. So, yeah. Um, so I've just, been doing a few, just a few things like that, you know, and keeping in touch with my current clients that are in hibernation. You know, their properties have had to be, Sort of put on hold, making sure I'm keeping in regular contact with them and just making sure they're okay. And yeah, and that's kind of been it. And I've just been trying to do lots of running and trying to get fit and lose a bit of weight and spend time with my kids. And yeah, it's just been a real mix, a bit of a little bit of business and a lot of home life. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, was lots of different ways of looking at it, but it's um, certainly been uh, a wonderful gift to have time with the family and a chance to work on the bits of the business that always end up getting shunted out of the way because something yeah. else either more urgent or important leaps in front of yeah. in front of it yeah what's what's going to be the focus in the coming weeks um 
well, as soon as we're into level three, it'll be it'll be um, re-engaging with people on with my current listings that have been that sort of been frozen for a while. So high priority for me is getting those properties, um, you know, successfully sold for my current vendors. Um, so I've got a real backlog of people, like I've been taking inquiry over the level four shutdown period. So I've got a master register. I've been logging all of that inquiry against. So I've got a real positive set of people to call. You know, as of sort of today, tomorrow, I'll be re-engaging with those people. So that's going to be my main focus is um, is getting the listings that had started with me before the level four, getting those activated and getting them engaged and hopefully getting them sold soon. Um, I have deliberately stayed clear of um, a lot of sort of client database contact during the lockdown. I just, once again, this is just me. I felt it might come across as being um inconsiderate to their their things that they might be going through to have you know me ringing them so i've just sort of parked all that but i see level two as being the opportunity for me to really start reconnecting with my longer term client database or people potential future listings and just seeing how they've managed to get through everything and have a chat with them and see what their thoughts are for the remainder of the year you know what do you think about the um, environment that we're heading into? Are there going to be um, people in a, in a fair bit of difficulty or do you think it's just going to come out pretty even keel? Um, hang on, mate. I'll just go and grab my crystal ball. I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> um, look, <laughs> no, uh, look, there's definitely going to be some people that are going to be more adversely affected by this than others. Um, it's, it is a big unknown, though. I don't think any of us truly know how this is all going to play out in the real estate sector until probably a few months down the track from where we are. I don't think that the impact will necessarily be felt immediately. I think there could be some um, residual pain that's going to take a few months to really flow through for people, you know, that, that have tried to re-energize their business and, and it just hasn't worked and they've had to pull the pin on things. And, um, you know, there will very unfortunately be some some um, forced sales where people are going to be in an unfortunate situation. And I think as agents, we have to be extremely empathetic to that and really understand the pain that people might be going through that we're going to be dealing with and be very sensitive to it. Um, if, you haven't, if you haven't got your um, emotional sort of radar on soon, you, you could potentially really, um, you know, offend some people and, and um, upset them. So I hope everyone's um, agents are thinking about that message of being kind because I think we're just, yeah, we're going to need to be kind to some vendors coming up soon. Yeah, definitely. So what have you learned uh, from your time in the fire service and how has that helped you in, in this business? Um, you know, it's a really interesting question, David. I When I first was considering... I can't talk to you, mate. <laughs> okay. When I was um, first considering, when I was still in the fire service, um, moving to real estate, you have to, and everyone has to do this, ask yourself the questions, what can I bring? Like what skill sets, what attributes do I have now in this career that could transfer into this career I'm considering going to? I think a lot of people make the decision that they're not happy doing what they're doing and they want to make a change. But the next question is the hardest one to answer is, well, what to? What can I do that's different? Especially if you've been doing something like I had for 24 years. I was very ingrained and embedded and highly skilled, but in a very specialist industry in the emergency management. So one of the things that came across with me, and I'm just getting back to the question that you asked, is my ability to understand people in a variety of different situations and empathize and understand what they're going through and how I can respond to that. Um, that came out of many, many years of working or responding to or being connected to people in very stressful situations, you know, in the fire service, you know, whether their house has just burnt down or, you know, they've been in a car accident or, you know, there's just multiple uh, incidents that we would have. And we were then dealing with the aftermath of that. If you weren't good at reading people and understanding what they were going through at that time, um, once again, you, you were, probably weren't going to be a very good professional firefighter. That ability to, for me to be able to go into a home now and talk with clients and gain their trust and understand why it is they're selling and how can I help 
is being a key part of my, I think, of my business success. I'm sure it has. I'm sure it has. This, uh, you know, dealing with people in a crisis situation or just a stressful situation, I'm sure yeah. that there's uh, huge parallels. Are you aware of how you do that? Uh, yeah, I, I actually ask people. Um, I mean, I'm really upfront about it. <laughs> um, so, when, so when I'm meeting people in their home and having a listening conversation, I think that's really important to emphasize. I don't call it a listing presentation. I put that word out of my vocabulary a long time ago. When I'm having a listing conversation or a pre-listing conversation, one of the very first things that I will do when I sit down with them after the introductions and just getting comfortable is I want to hear from them. I don't want to sit down and start spelling out some sort of um, dialogue from me about why I'm going to be the best agent for them. So I literally just ask, what is it, if you don't mind, Mr. and Mrs. Vendor, would you mind sharing with me why you've called me here today to talk with you? There's obviously some reason that you're considering selling your home, and those reasons can be like many and varied. If you don't mind sharing with me what your reasons are, it will really help me to understand how I can best help you through that process. For example, if it's a divorce or a separation coming up, you need to be conscious of that because that could affect the way that you communicate with those people. Um, if it's downsizing, upsizing, whatever, it gives you an opportunity to talk about what's been changing with their family. If they're downsizing, have they got children that have moved to university or whatever, it just lets you get a genuine um, engagement and conversation going with these people. And they feel like then, and this is genuine, you're not there just to preach to them and try and sell yourself to them. You're here to hear from them and understand what their needs are and how you can best help them. And I think that's a critical, different approach to pre-listing. And um, yeah, you can't have empathy with, with a client when you don't know what their situation is, because how, how can you work out what their, their motivations, their needs, their upsets are if they haven't communicated that with you? Now, you'll only get that if they trust you. So if they feel that you're not genuine, they, they won't share that information with you. Um, so creating that early rapport is, is vital to that question working or not working. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I've uh, had the privilege of working with you for a number of years and you're just a genuine good guy, you know? Um, and I don't think there's any substitute from coming from a place where you authentically and it's actually, you, you're doing it because you want to help people. Um, but I think just that alone isn't necessarily enough because you also have to be um, brave enough to ask the tough questions yeah. and, uh, and, and aware enough and present enough to listen, not just for the idea oh, yeah, we're downsizing and think, okay, cool, I've got to find them a smaller place, but actually to understand that next piece, oh, have their kids left home or yeah. what's the situation behind that? Yeah. And if you've, if you've I mean, most vendors will be talking to more than one agent and if you can be genuine and you can create some rapport with those people and, and if they can believe by the time you, that you leave that meeting that you are there for whatever is best for them and you have just followed up or you've got the slick agent coming in next to you that gives the exact opposite impression, which is all they're thinking about is the commission that they can earn if they get this listing. Um, you've gone a long way to actually securing that listing just by being genuine, you know. Um, and my one philosophy, there's so many things we could talk about, David, but that I've carried all the way through is every decision that you make and every action that you take, it should be always about what's best for the vendor. If you just put your own agendas and your own in any selfish motivations you have and just park them and just get rid of them and always put the vend what's best for your vendor first, you will organically create a business reputation um, that just grows exponentially quickly because everyone talks to their neighbours, to their family, to, their, to the other mums and dads at the school pick up while they're waiting outside. Um, so if you can be genuine and just do the best you can for your clients all the time and never ever make a call or a decision that's tainted by that would actually be a bit better for me. For example, how are you going to market this property? Um, I don't know how things work in every company, but um, for Barfin and Thompson, if you're listing by um, auction, that's a big advantage for the listing agent in terms of the per percentage that you will earn. But for me, I genuinely look at every property and would only promote what I believe is the best marketing system 
for their circumstances and their property. If that means I'm going to earn less as the listing agent, so be it. If I know it's going to be the most successful outcome for my client, that's what I'm going to recommend that they consider. So um, it's just vital. I think selfish agents just burn out in the end because inevitably the word gets around that they're out. They're only out there, you know, for themselves. I think it's outstanding advice. Take the time to really understand your client. Put them first. Do the right thing, and uh, it comes back around. And certainly yeah. it has in your case, Tony. I really appreciate you being generous enough to share uh, your advice and the things that you've learned uh, in your time, mate. Thank yeah, you so much. Well. Thank you. Thanks for um, having me on. Appreciate it, David. Total pleasure, mate. Good okay. on you. Catch you later.